So we are here today uh, to to interview and celebrate uh, Brigitte and Hans Matson. I remember very clearly our time in New York City. We were at Travis's uh, um, workplace, and I was so excited to have a chance to interview, and I really wanted to do it in video, but we weren't ready to do video yet. Uh, it was audio only back then. And uh, But I'm glad we waited, because now uh, you've been a little bit farther along in your journey, and you've had more experiences, and lots of changes have happened. Uh, and most importantly, you've taken the time to work with Christina Henke to, I need a copy of the books. Uh, can someone ru rush me a copy of the books? I wanna show them. Uh, but you've had a chance to, um, to write down and share your stories. Um, so as they're, as they're going to get it, I just wanna say, I'm just so grateful that you've taken the time uh, to write these books. And so uh, this is the Swedish version of, of the book. We're gonna start promoting it. And I don't even know how to pronounce that. So I'm gonna ask you, Hans, to tell us what that says. What does that say? Now in Swedish, sök de sanning, fan tvivel. Okay. And translate to English, seeking truth, found doubts. Okay. Um, that's, the, that's the book in Swedish, if you're Swedish, or I guess sometimes Danes and Norwegians can read Swedish, is yeah, that right? Or return missionaries. Or return Swedish. missionaries, they can, <laughs> they can read the Swedish version. Or if you don't speak Swedish or read Swedish, you can now uh, check out the English version which we're also here to promote, Truth Seeking with Hans Matson and Christina Henke. And uh, we're, we're very excited. Uh, we want everyone to buy this book, to give it a positive review on Amazon, and to share it with their believing and loving and non-believing and non-member family and friends because it's, it's a story and it's an important story. And uh, we, uh, we're excited to talk to you about that and other things. How does that sound? Great. Are you ready? Sure. Okay. Why not? <laughs> and we are live streaming and we're welcoming uh, all of our viewers from across the world now and in the future. We're recording this for those who want to hear the podcast. But we're just thrilled to have you guys back on Mormon Stories and we're thrilled to be capturing you on video for the first time. Brigitte, do you want to say anything uh, as we welcome you back to Mormon Stories? It feels great to be here with you, John. <laughs> it's good to see you again after a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's seven years. And it's great to be on a live stream. Yeah. To meet all the people out there, many Facebook friends. So hello to you all. <laughs> <laughs> and much love. <laughs> Absolutely. What year did we do our interview? Uh, 2013. So five years ago. So it's kind of five years since you came out. So we're going to try and do something a little bit uh, more complex because there are going to be people that didn't listen to your interview who don't know who you are and that are kind of listening for the first time. We don't want to go back and re-interview you with all the ground that we covered. So we want to sort of give a briefer version of your story and let people know that if you want to just Google Matson. Mormon stories, you'll be able to find a, a very extensive multi-hour interview with Hans and Brigitte. So we encourage you to go back and listen to that first before you listen to this interview. But also we, we want to just kind of give a summary of your life experiences before we talk about what's happened since the interview. Is that okay? Is that all right? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> Brigitte starts. The okay. ladies first. <laughs> so Brigitte, let's just go really briefly you were a convert to the church. You were not raised Mormon, is that right? Yeah. I met Hans at a military place. I worked in the kitchen, and there he was. And I fell immediately in love with him. And I had a response, the same for him. And um, he told me about the church. And I investigated, and I get baptized, and... Uh, was very happy to be a Mormon, and then we got married, and we had five kids, and uh, had a very happy life in church, really enjoyed it. Um, 
Yeah, and and we talk about your courtship in our in our interview, and it's a really good, fun story. Yeah. For the listeners who are joining us who have no idea why we're interviewing Hans or Brigitte, I'll just add that Hans is probably the highest ranking sort of former church, LDS church leader that we've ever had on Mormon Stories podcast. Uh, in 2000, Hans, you know, after serving in Bishop Ricks and stake presidencies, Hans was called to be in the third quorum of the 70 in Area 30 70, uh, covering uh, several countries in Europe. And so he's a former, you know, we would think general authority sort of level um, uh, leader in the church. And and it wasn't until after Hans um, uh, left his position as an area authority to where he started to really question the church. And and so that's uh, part of, of why we're doing this interview, just for those who aren't clear. So, so yeah, so Hans, thank you for that introduction, Brigitte. Uh, Hans, just tell us really briefly, and you talked about this in our interview also yesterday, but... Tell us just a little bit about your your heritage and, and your upbringing in the church as well here in Sweden. Yeah, I have a nice, uh, beautiful heritage. My grandfather, Oscar, and his wife, uh, Hildegard, moved from Värmland down to Gothenburg. And uh, there, uh, the missionaries uh, knocked on the doors, and uh, they were taught the, the gospel of Mormonism. And they join the church. And there, the youngest kid of their, they have four kids, and my father was the youngest one. So he, when he turned eight, he also was baptized a Mormon. So after that, we grew up, and uh, uh, no, he grew up, of course, and then he married my Clara, my mother, and we, we were uh, a family of four boys. So I'm um, one of the last ones in that family, twin brother and myself. And uh, yeah, that's that's the, how the heritage comes in. And of course, then we were we were really uh, uh, devoted Mormons, and with with everything and, and absolutely uh, faith in in the tr- truth of the gospel, and and uh, that we were selected to be one one of those who could be in Zion to uh, uh, meet Christ, and my father even thought I could be one of the high priests that could build a temple through the where Christ will receive in, in America, Missouri. Wow, that's intense. Yeah, it is. It's great. D- did uh, did you guys have scripture study and family prayer and family meeting growing up? All the time. All the time. Yeah, and uh, sometimes we really loved it. Sometimes we just had uh, a prayer and fighting, and then <laughs> then a closing prayer. <laughs> but most of it was pretty good. Yes. Did all the brothers serve missions? No, my two older brothers did not serve, and uh, I guess that is more or less that the Swedish youth uh, boys were not really trained that way. So so when when I and my brother grew up, we we. Uh, I guess we started a trend in a way that go on a mission, even if you are Swedish, you don't have to come from Utah or California. So yeah, we two were the first ones in the Matson family. And uh, so tell us a little bit about where you served, and did your brother, Leif, is your brother, right? My brother Leif, as Leif? they say in Swedish. Leif, sorry, Leif. <laughs> That's Viking, your twin. Viking name, yeah. Right. And, Did you guys serve at about the same time? We served. We got called, got our callings at the same time, and uh, we both were called to uh, Great Britain. And uh, he was called to Northern part, and uh, I was called to the Midlands of Britain. So, so we served there from the 15th of September, 1970 to uh, 1972. Did you like it? Oh, it was a great experience. How did Brits find a Swede in, in the early 70s? Did they, well, were they I, receptive? Did they like having you around? Or Well, we felt we were more or less better accepted than Americans, but I think that maybe had to do with the Vietnam War. Some of them didn't like the, the war, and uh, the Americans were involved there, but, but we were Swedish, and, and uh, I think it was better okay. for us at least. <laughs> So did you have success on your mission? And Well, uh, what, tell me what success is. Numbers. <laughs> I'm uh, kidding. I'm, I'm being a little sarcastic. 
<laughs> souls, <laughs> souls. I can tell you like this, and we don't count the baptisms for the dead, just the livings. And okay. we had a goal to baptize 100 people, and we did that uh, plus. As your mission? Yeah. Okay. Not, my, not myself, but my twin brother and myself, yeah. Between the two of you, to baptize 100 people? Yes, sir. That's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of souls. success. A lot yeah. of souls. Yeah. Okay. I still have contact with some of them. He, he, two days ago, I had an uh, email from one uh, Tony Butler who said, I just read your book, and uh, I remember you as my missionary, and you taught me, and you baptized me, and... Uh, he said, I read the book, and we can probably talk about it a little bit more later, he said, and I'm willing to do that. You know. So um, we're not going to cover your, your life in depth, because we've already covered that. But suffice it to say, you completed a successful mission. You met, do you want to talk anything about your courtship with Brigitte? Did, you didn't know her before your mission, right? No. And I imagine you would have been taught to marry a, a righteous Mormon, no, or not? You no, know, when we arrived from England on the airport, there was a few girls waiting for us, or at least their mothers, and they were like to introduce their daughters. And, uh, Swedes? Well, uh, yes, they were really Swedes. Waiting for you as, as you returned home. Well, uh, that's uh, how I thought it should be. And, and I think it was, uh, maybe I'm a big headed, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you were Sweden's two most eligible Mormon bachelors, right? Yeah, that's the way we don't baptize uh, so many Swedes. I mean, no, uh, sorry. No, I mean, uh, uh, I guess a return missionary coming home, of course, you're looking for a wife to stay with. And my patriotic blessing says I will uh, find a beautiful... Uh, blonde, blue-eyed girls. And Does just, it literally say blonde and blue-eyed? Yes. In your patriarchal blessing? Yes. I need, I need all the guidance I, <laughs> I want. It came true. Yeah. And it really worried me when I met her <laughs> because she was not a member, you know? Yeah. But then I found out my, my father gave me a blessing before I went to the, into the military service. And this was 1973. And he said, during your military service, you will find someone you will bring into the church. So I, I really was active as a missionary among all the uh, soldiers there. And I don't know if everybody liked it, but, but uh, at least uh, when I had some food, Birgitta was working there and serving. And uh, as I said yesterday, she's still serving the food at home. <laughs> but there was a, a fantastic moment, you know, the whole body was burning and the soul was just uh, feeling like uh, unconditional love. The only problem was that she smoked and drank coffee. What were you thinking, Brigitte? Well, I don't know. I was just myself. <laughs> okay. What <laughs> made you join the church besides Hans? Um, I really like the coming to church the first time. I felt that I was very welcomed, like by a family, and accepted, and I was shown much love. So I really, I was young, you know, I was only 17. A lot of youth welcoming me, and of course, I know this guy who was famous, and that also was kind of more accepting of me, I think. What did you love most about Hans besides his handsomeness? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love his, the most I love of Hans is that he is totally honest. And, and you felt that way then? Uh, yeah. Was he yeah. honest with yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, he, had a, he has a way of treating people so lovable and kind and respectful. So everyone loves him. And he's really, yeah, a so nice honesty person. honesty and oh, kind. Yeah. And blue eyes. And blue eyes. And blue eyes, yeah. And Hans, what did you love about Brigitte to want to go outside the covenant to marry her? Or at least, you know. I, I just said uh, this was really a tough decision. I mean, uh, I mean, you can look even now, she's beautiful, you know. And, and uh, just to look at her, I got a warm feeling all over. And, and uh, when I saw her first time, I, I just thought, wow, 
I can see you dressed in white. I just take away the cigarette and the coffee. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, just, just uh, she was a wonderful, sweet person. And, and uh, when I, I have to tell you something. I asked her out for a date. And she said yes. And I was so nervous, you know, return missionary, never been on a date. And she said yes, and she's not a member. We're going to go out and dance. I was so nervous, and then she called and said, no, I can't do it this time because of my boyfriend. Oops. And I said, oh, I'm already released. But I found out that we have a second uh, uh, date, and I asked my fellow uh, soldiers in the military to ask her if she wanted to go out together, and she did. All right, and the rest is history. The rest is history, and beautiful history. <laughs> Brigitte, did you end up gaining your own testimony of the church or or not? Yeah. You did? When we met, um, before I had the discussions with the missionary, he introduced me to the gospel. We talked about the gospel very much. And, um, and also when I met the missionaries, they kind of thought, hmm, you don't have any questions. Uh, uh, you seem to accept everything without questioning. But as I said, I was young and I felt it was a very nice plan of salvation and, and for family life. And I really liked it. But I felt I need to have this answer. So one night, I, I, Hans taught me to pray. I've never prayed before. And it felt so important that I had my own answer from God. So uh, one night when I was alone, I... I prayed to God, and I felt that I had a very strong answer of a feeling of warmth and a secure feeling of this is true. And it felt so good. It felt like a burning uh, fire inside me, really. Like it is this, um, described in the, in the uh, scriptures. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and later that night... Hans came by because I still lived at my parents' house and knocked on the door and I opened and I said to him, oh, I had an answer. I know it's true and I want to get baptized. So it was really, and this testimony really was with me through my whole life in church. And I think that made me a little hard to listen to him in the beginning. Sure. Yeah. When he started questioning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you really believed it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I thought everyone had this kind of spiritual yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Including him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, he had. Yeah. Okay, so you get married. You got, did, you, you, did you end up getting married in the temple at first? or? Uh, this is the way it was. She, we wrote to the first presidency asking if Birgitta can go to the temple in Switzerland before be, she been a member for 12 years. 12 because, months, right? 20. Yeah. Uh, thank you. No, no. <laughs> That's a long uh, time, 12 years. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but the, this had to do with, with the Swedes in Gothenburg have the time set when they can visit the temple in Switzerland. So this was in November. And she was baptized in January. We got the answer, and she was allowed to, to go with us. And we had to get married first in a civil uh, setting. So the mission president uh, came down, and uh, we had a great wedding with the Begitas. Uh, all family were there, and an enjoyable time. And, and, and uh, then the day after, we went down to Switzerland. This is going to seem a little bit coarse uh, for me to say, but I was talking to someone who was married in Europe, and I found out, and I just, I'm just i just going to be honest, I didn't know this. What this person told me was, even though Europeans might get married civilly before they get married in the temple, this friend told me they weren't allowed to actually consummate the marriage or have sex until they were actually sealed in the temple. Is that is that just what I've heard, or is that... Well, Generally, tradition. There, and... there was a rumor, more or less, from one large family living in, in Gothenburg Stake that talked about that, that, that this is how we will do it. Uh, but we didn't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, in this case, the couple told me this the story of like they get married civilly and then they have to like drive to the temple and like there was this whole entourage of parents following them in the car to make sure they remain chaste until the point that they uh, got married in the temple. So I don't know if that's everyone's experience. They must be but. their own type <laughs> of laws they created to be special. So not spe everybody's. Special. No. Okay. I okay. mean, if you were married a civil and then have to wait 12 years, <laughs> yeah. would, would you wait? I mean, yeah. How many of you have heard of that? that tradition okay so, so i'm not crazy right some of you all right okay so we're going to fast forward a bit so you were married in the temple and eventually you got sealed 10 or 11 months later you got to do it before the 12 month mark uh you ended up having four children yeah and one more five five children yeah yes and one more so five children yeah but how many boys girls Three boys first, and then two girls who are here tonight. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Hey. Ha Hanna and Anna what Clara. Are what are their names? Anna Clara and Hanna. Uh, welcome. It's so <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. I want to talk to them. Uh, all right. And then your three sons. Where are your sons? They are uh, quite active in the in, in their lives with their their big families. Okay. So, well, a, a shout out to the. Mats and sons. Their names are Daniel, Hans Jr., and uh, Johan. Okay. Excellent. Well, a shout out to them. So uh, I imagine you raised your children as committed to the church as you had been raised, Hans. Is that right? Yeah. We love, we love to have the kids understand the gospel from the beginning. So we read the scriptures. We have the family home evening. We share spiritual experiences. And... I took the boys where I used to be a missionary in England and go around, and this is my first door I knocked on, and this is where I kneel behind the chapel and, and so on. It's all in, in the book. And, and, uh, and uh, of course, Birgitta was just a lovely mum, staying home mum. Uh, at least we had the, the fortune to, to have that going. Yeah, I loved having kids, raise them, and be a home-staying mom. I really love that. And of course, with Hans, having the, already has high positions in the church, yeah, I had to be more home with the kids and uh, doing things there. How did you like having the church as a community and as a support with a young family and, and with five children? Did you enjoy your time in the church? Yeah. Very what did, much. What did you love about it? What were some of the things you loved about it? I love to, to serve in the church. I was a lot in young women. I loved that. I was in primary and sometimes in relief society, but mostly youth, young women. And I loved, loved that. What did you love about that? Uh, to be around young uh, women and uh, go out hiking. And uh, you get so much uh, immediate response from youth. And it's so great, really, to be... It feels alive to be around them, really. How did you like having your children being able to be part of a strong religious community? Did you feel like it was good for your children? Yeah, yeah, of course. What was, what was good for them? Um, to, the, to have the church teachings support our own beliefs... And also making friends with same kind of, um, I don't find the words, I'm sorry, but the same beliefs. Sure. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that's having friendship with other youth and um, children and our beliefs. And did you like your the wards you grew Gothenburg is in nor is north of Stockholm, right? Is no, no, no. It's southwest of Stockholm. Yeah. Okay, I've got I've got my it's about country about 500 down. kilometers southwest. Okay, so where's where's Gothenburg in Sweden? There. South southwest portion of I can I can show you. Okay. So way south, quite okay. south. Not all the way Stockholm down. Is up there. Oh, where's Stockholm? Okay, got it. Got it. Got it. So it's kind of in the southwestern corner of the west coast. Okay. Or the best coast. The best coast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
Hans, oh, go ahead. What were you going to say? I just want to say that many of the people here are the neighbors, and uh, we are in the same ward many times. And I was the stake president for some of them, and bishop as well. And they all have a lot of kids, and we live very close in the area in Kungsbacka. And and uh, their kids are our friends, and our our kids are their friends. So there was a huge group of, of good people, and uh, we just love that, just to live an honest, good life. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't know everything, I guess, but we think they were good kids. Yeah. So uh, as I understand it, religions, uh, Sweden is more secular than probably the United States is. Oh yeah. And so it's kind of weird in Sweden to be religious at all. And then to be Mormon and religious is even kind of like double weird. But I imagine when you were growing up, you may have been, and we interviewed the people from Norway this morning, and they also expressed something very similar, kind of feeling like outcasts, kind of feeling like they didn't always fit in at school. Um, but I'm wondering if that was okay because you had these wards and stakes that you were a part of and you had your friends in your community within the church. I mean, I was also growing up as a kid in a family and even then there was less youth and less kids around. But, you know, the opposite is that you are a missionary. You, you can help other ones to understand only true and living gospel. You, you are some spe you a chosen one. You, I mean... You must live a fantastic life before you were born. To be born in Sweden and in a Mormon family, <laughs> I mean, who are you really? Maybe I'm glad I don't know because I must be the one great and mighty or something. Uh, so, so the one mighty and strong. Yeah, yeah. I know I'm strong, but now I know. <laughs> see, see, that helps a lot, you know, to have that feeling that you are special. But, but, of course, uh, uh, everybody don't feel that way because they feel kind of uh, weird around. And, of course, every time they have something like sports, you play soccer and, of course, some games and things are on Sunday. And you said, no, I can't. Or our kids, one of them were a really good soccer player. But we said, no, you don't play on Sundays. And we have a lot of his coaches contacted us, and we had to explain. And he was standing there, you know, all right. <laughs> so we went on Saturday night to pick him up wherever he was, and he was home on Sunday. And well, I don't really know what he thought about it then, but we did. So it sounds like even though you were different than most Swedes, you got a sense of strength, uh, a sense of confidence from being different but special kind of well, a saturday's warrior right i mean that that's my experience i don't know if everybody has that but that's helped me a lot so as you uh as you're coming off your mission marrying Brigitta, raising a family did you have in your mind haha someday i'll be bishop haha someday i'll be stake president haha someday i may even become an area authority was that kind of in your plan it it, no one would want, no Mormon man that I know would want to admit that they kind of aspired to be bishop or aspired to be stake president or, heaven forbid, aspired to be an area authority. But, but secretly, did you have a vision for the leadership positions you might hold in the church? I, I would say like this. Uh, this may come to a shock of the public uh, audience. My father said the Matsons, we are leaders. We come from the tribe of Joseph, and he was a leader. So we are natural leaders. And of course, through, so prepare for that. So when you marry a girl, have a healthy girl that can support you, because as a leader, you will not be home that much, you know. So I was uh, kind of uh, given indoctrination about where to look and how to look and how my, my, my plan, or not my plan, but what the plan would be for a, a Matson. Uh, I hope you forgive me, uh, the audience. <laughs> but yeah, that's what it is, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I've, you know, somebody wrote, there, every, every country, like in, let's just say in Europe, and this is probably true all over the world, where there's a heavy Mormon concentration, there are always sort of like four or five or six family names 
that are viewed as like the strong families, the noble families, the pioneer families in that country. You know, London, England has them. You know, Guatemala has them. What were what were some of the family names that were viewed as sort of like the Mormon royalty or the Mormon elite? Matson was one of them, according to some of the return missionaries that have written in to ask questions. I mean, Van Nelens is one of those. You maybe ask those people up here. Shout, shout out any names. Malm, Palm. They were listed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Matson w- would be included at some point, right? Yeah, if the return missionary says that, I believe them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's hard to say that you are uh, yeah. one of those, but uh, well, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, and that, that comes into play later. So would you? Uh, so, at what age were you called into the bishopric at first? I, I, I was called <laughs> as a branch, branch president first. At what age? Uh, I was 28. Okay. Mm-hmm. French president. Yeah. And then uh, a bishop, I was 31, I think, yeah. That's pretty young yeah. to be bishop. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I always sitting on the stand. If I'm not the branch president, I was the counselor. So I always seen my wife on the meetings all the time, fighting with the kids. And, and uh, so I was sitting on, on the stand. I could never help her with the kids in, in the meeting time. Now, Brigitte, some would say, oh, poor wife, she has to sit and wrangle all the, the five children while the husband's up there being a leader. How did you experience that? Were you sad? Were you happy? What were you feeling to have to have Hans serve in the church and have his job and you're watching the kids? Most of the time it was, it was no problem because the kids were very nice. But, uh, of course, I myself had some responsibilities, and that was the most problematic things, because then some of the boys really didn't like it to me, also being up on the stand and having things. So I had a guy kicking me all the time at my leg all the time when I was standing up and have my lessons, and and, uh, that was kind of hard. To have your own callings as well. Yeah, yeah. But generally, how did you feel about, like, him serving and you taking care of the kids were you i didn't mind you didn't mind no no did you love it yeah yeah i really loved to being a mom and and i didn't think that was a big problem okay no and the kids were very nice kids they were they were okay you yeah. guys were okay yeah yeah <laughs> okay um so bishop by 31 when did you first get into a stake presidency uh just uh, when i think about 35 you were in the counselor, to counselor the state, state president, presidency yeah. in Gothenburg. Yes. Okay. And then I was called as a, uh, as the state president uh, for a while now. In what what year? Or at what age? I think I was forty. Forty. Help me! I'm sixty-seven, eighteen, sixty-seven years. He was called ninety-five as a state president. Okay, so, so it was 45. 45, yeah. And how many years did you serve as state president? I served for three years only because we moved to Stockholm. Okay. And because of that, I was released. Okay. <gasps> and did you enjoy your time as state president? I was terrified at first when I was called. And the, the, the day after, I was around, driving around in my car and wondering if I even uh, was worthy to do anything uh, right or wrong. And it's so easy to be a counselor. You don't have to take the decisions, but to be the president is quite, maybe Birgitta can explain. Yeah, I just have a memory that sticks to me that I was working at my brother's restaurant and he came in for lunch and he came into my office and he cried and I said, what is it? What, why are you crying? And he said, um, the stake president is going to move. And I feel I'm going to be the next stake president. And I feel so um, terrified. And he was crying. And he really didn't seek for... He has never been a person who had been seeking for high responsibilities. Never. Okay. Thank you. So uh, between being called as an area authority and those three years you served as stake president, did you have other big callings or 
Just to give us kind of the list. Yeah, I served as uh, the mission president's counselor okay. for taking care of northern part of Sweden. There were districts up there. You know. Okay. And, and uh, well, I, I guess that's what I did. Yeah, I served in Stockholm also before that as a high councilman in the, in the Stockholm South the State. state. Okay. <gasps> okay. Okay, so... Um, Can I tell you one thing, though? When I was called as a stake president... One very close uh, friend to me uh, called me in in the same day and said, do you know, this night I had uh, a an, an very strong and confirming feeling that I was the one who should be a, a, a stake president, not you. And uh, I prepared everything. I had who, who should be the stay, my counselor, who should be the Relief Society president, and everything. So I, I'm just puzzled about how they can call you when I was supposed to be the one. <laughs> and I really wonder, well, shall I uh, uh, say I'm sorry that they that did wrong, or shall I hug him, or shall I kick him in the back, or what shall I do? It's tough, you know, just have a calling, and then someone said it's wrong because I'm the one. Uh, I don't. Na- I put. The, I don't put the name out there. Yeah, that's fine. Today, <laughs> but inspiration is tricky. Like everybody can get their own inspiration, and how do you know whose inspiration is right? I hope there is right when they call me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, so f- listeners of the audience, viewers can go back to our our former interview yeah. with Hansa Brigitte to, to fill in a lot of these details. Um, let's jump to. At what age were you uh, called in to be an area authority? Around what age? I was the year I should turn uh, uh, 60. 60, okay. No, 50. 50. Yeah, sorry, one decade wrong. Okay, no, that's fine. So uh, do you have a sense for how you got on the radar of whatever general authorities, you know, would have helped make that decision? I think really it had to do when, when the general authorities visiting Sweden... And uh, I was the stake president, and uh, or when I was the mission president counselor, because you meet them a lot, you sit with them in meetings and so on. So I think maybe they got some idea that maybe there is one candidate to be something more. And who who were some of the general authorities that you would have interacted with during those years? Do you remember any names? Pinock. Okay. Ella Pinock. Okay. Elder. Uh, uh, About DDA. Yeah, I met him. Yeah. Okay. Condi. And uh, uh, John Fowler. Okay. Samuelson. Elder Samuelson. Cecil. Yeah. Cecil. Yeah. Okay. <gasps> All right. Those would have been some of you. Some you would have interacted with. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, there has been, um, remind me, there's been a lot of talk, and one of the things people are really excited to have read in your book is that you actually sort of acknowledged publicly for the first time that you both received the second anointing uh, at some point. How many years into your area authority position what? did that happen? Because I want to know if I want to ask you questions before that or... Was yeah. that before you became an area authority? No, this happened... Three uh, years in, right? Yes, three, okay. 2003. That, that's what I remembered. Okay, so let's talk about before then. So one of the things that was really fascinating, well, tell us what it was like to be called as an area authority, because that's kind of a big deal. How did you guys feel about that? Uh, and in some ways, it's both of you. It's not just Hans. So I want to hear how both of you felt. I mean... Uh, Who called you, and, and how did you feel? Well... Actually, we were called to meet Ellie Condi at the airport of Stockholm, Orland Airport. And he said, can I prepare anything? Uh, no. You didn't so, know why you were being called? No. Okay. And, uh, and now the word goes to my wife. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just going to say that I think this was in February or something. January. January 2000. 2000? 2000, yeah. 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 And did you kind of think, well, this is my time, or did you... No, I, I wonder why should I meet him at the airport? Usually I go up there and pick them up and take them to some places. But he, he, he said, no, we're going to meet there, see if you can find a room or so. Well, then I got worried a little bit, you know. 
Worried meaning excited. I mean, uh, there's something going on. Maybe this is some callings that could come. So we went up there. Uh, we dressed up. We said, told the kids that we we're going out for a little while. And uh, we met him there. We were sitting down in a little room there with a nice fauteuil. Is that English? On, on a stool. Okay. Okay. A uh, sofa. That's the word. Okay. And he said, I have a calling for the first presidency. He took up a letter and he said, you need to open it. And in that, it was the first presidency just giving the calling that he, they want me to, they want to call me to be in the SN70, in the third quorum as an area authority. And to, that I will be, um, my name will be put for the uh, congregation at the general conference in, a in April. And whose prophet, wh whose name was? Uh, Gordon B. Hinckley. Okay, this is 2000, President Hinckley was still alive. Yeah. And how did you feel and how did you feel reading that letter? Well, you know, I think everyone would feel like, wow, do I really know the gospel or the handbooks or why didn't I go on the uh, uh, church education system? There was, was not in Sweden when I grew up, see? And I felt just so little, like in Spanish, I say poco poco. And, and, and you feel just humble. Mm -hmm. And then I said to myself, well, I haven't called myself. It's not me. They have, if they call me, that's their problem, really. <laughs> I, I have to be the one I am, I guess. Yeah. You know, this is how I thought. Brigitte, anything you want to add? Were you proud? Were you excited? Were you scared? Were you... Um, I was kind of, I didn't really know what an area authority really meant, 70. And I don't know if Hans really knows so much about maybe a little more than me, but I understand that this was a very high position. And um, of course that he will be traveling a lot. And um, yeah, it felt um, kind of... Um, uh, I was kind of proud of him. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And uh, Was this the first Swedish area authority? Yeah, yeah. That's a big deal. It is. Yeah. And also I felt he is the man to have a position like this because he of his loving personality. And people will love him. You're like, uh, the Lord got it right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And there was no one else who talked to me afterwards said, I used, to, I should be the <laughs> that one. That was me. No. That was my colleague. <laughs> no. You got my colleague. Yeah. But <laughs> in a way, you feel kind of proud also. I like to say humbly proud. Because, like, you know, it's kind of something that I would know that everybody in General Comfort would listen to my name and my twin brothers, my older brothers, my siblings the United States and everyone so is yeah uh, were your parents alive at the time uh, my mother was was my she dad. proud was she proud oh yeah the name of the Matson her son I'm her favorite son <laughs> <laughs> but the thing was you know we're not allowed to say anything to anybody about this until before. general conference yeah and did they fly you to Salt Lake to to receive the call and to yes. go to General Conference yes. that yes. April? Yes. The whole family. Oh, nice. In business class. Oh, wow. That's expensive. <laughs> not, we not were the there, the whole family, but they paid for us. Yeah. Okay. You guys flew business class. I have to say, we were paying for our kids. Okay. okay. But the church gave us the uh, yeah, business class. All right. That's the only time I went in business class. Just Oh, really? Yeah. Just when you receive the call? Yes, and okay. then you have to sit in the back again. In the coach, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here promoting this book, Truth Seeking. This is the English version of the book. And uh, I love this book. I read it, uh, I read it in one night. Um, it's, it's actually quite a, a fast read because it's so interesting. And um, one of the, I'm not going to try and uh, explain the whole book while we're here, but... One of the parts I loved were your observations about your training as a general authority, as an area authority. Um, a lot of the messages you received in your training maybe weren't what you were expecting 
from President Hinckley and from others. Are you comfortable sharing any of those stories of some of the messages that, that, were, that were taught that you uh, didn't quite expect? Yeah, I mean, when we see President Hinckley in to visit on a state conference, and so he's, he's lovable and he's good and he used scriptures and so on. But in, in, in this training meeting, we, we trained every year. We went to the church office, we sit in there for four days, and first presidents uh, teach us, the 12 teachers and the seven presidents of uh, the, the quorums of the 70 teachers. And uh, President Hinckley goes up there, you know, and he slams his hand in the pulpit, bang, and everybody wakes up, it, twice at least. And, and he says, you know, you guys, you give me the golden report, how many you baptize and how many you uh, have coming back to uh, return back to the church from inacti inactivity. But you know, I look at the sacrament meetings presented, nothing has happened there. <laughs> I don't like to have those golden reports. I like the truth. And I think it was beautiful, you know. A, uh, then I can see he's not only a nice prophet, he's, he's the president of the corporation of the, of the Mormons. And he said, I'll look at the figures. And at the time he says, um, uh, we need to have some more missionaries in the North America because that's where the money is. And uh, the, the one we baptize in Africa, they don't give us any money at all. They just, what do you say, uh, we have to give them the money. They take and they don't they give. They take and not give yeah. is expensive. But when we baptize more in North America, we got more tithing in. So that really, in a way, shocked me a little bit. You know, how can I talk about money when we talk about souls to save Saved him, and you know, and 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 uh, one of my uh, what I was sitting, he was the area president in in Europe. He said, "Now you can see the president is talking as the um, the boss of the whole corporation." You said CEO, right? CEO, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, the CEO. They're basically saying you've seen, you know, Hinckley the prophet. Now you get to see Hinckley the CEO, yeah. right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And he is. He's the president of the corporation of the yeah, church. He is. He's, he's literally the president but, but of the corporation. But then I didn't know there was a corporation. Right, right, right. I right. thought it was a church. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, a registered church. Yeah, yeah. Not the trademark. <laughs> you also mentioned his observations about the Olympics. Do you want to share? Yes. That, that was really hard on those general authorities in the 70s that uh, he said, we the Winter Olympics in... It was 2002, in, right? 2002 was the Olympics in, in Salt Lake City. And the church put millions, millions of, of dollars in to support that. And he says, we can't see any return on investment. investment. So where's the return on our investment? Right? Yeah, yeah, so you go home and make it happen. Yeah. He was really angry at us, and, and the, the church puts up money, and they couldn't see the return or the money. Yeah, so I guess that, that must have been hard. On the one hand, uh, you, you know, on the one hand, you can see, uh, you would expect him to be about souls and Jesus and kindness and mm -hmm. love. And, and on the other hand, they're running a business because they have assets and they have investments and they mm -hmm. have expenses, and they need to bring home the bacon to pay for their expenses and to grow yeah. the church, right? But as a regular member, uh, as uh, growing up in a church, you never heard that side. You don't know. You don't even know that the, uh, the church owned bonds or, or uh, stocks, or stocks and, yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Because they don't talk about it. Yeah. With, and, you know, they talk about don't do gambling and so on. What is stocks is gambling on, on, on the market, isn't it? Sometimes it goes up and sometimes it's down. That's a real gambling. But they're pretty successful. Uh, yeah. Success. Yeah, they are, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's really what shocked me a little bit then, to have this just given to me. And, uh, but now I can say, of course, they need, to, they need to have pay all the general authorities. They need to pay everyone who works for the church. They have buildings. They have temples. They have churches. 
They have cars for everybody, you know, and of course, it's a lot of money. Yeah. So in my interview with you both, we talk more in depth about what it was like to be an area authority. So we're not going to cover that this time. I'm going to I'm going to refer you all to the book and to uh, the interview that we did previously. But um, I, I do want to talk about so so. Uh, had you had any doubts about the truthfulness of the church prior to becoming an area authority? Never. And then during these first couple of years, prior to your second anointing, did any of this cause you to start doubting? No. Nope. So no. Uh, so nope. three years into your time as an area authority. Just happy go lucky. Okay. Yeah. In the bubble, wonderful bubble. My wife was there. My kids was there. My whole family was there. Adam was there in the end of the chain. So we just had to be sealed to him, and I have, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, priesthood was there, and I'm going to build a temple in Missouri, and, you know, my dad prayed that he would be the last Swede who lived for Zion, and he's just happy. Okay. so you Fantastic were, world to live in. And, Brigitte, what was it like to have him now serve as an area authority? Because one of the things we talked about in our interview previously, you first and second quorums of the 70 get paid. But third, fourth, and fifth quorums of the 70 don't get paid. So you have to have your day job and then pay for a lot of your own work. And you're still raising the family. Birgitta, what was that like on the family to have him, for all intents and purposes, doing the work of a general authority but not getting paid for it? He was not home. He was working all week. And then at the weekend, he was traveling. So I became a... Single mom. Uh huh. I had to do everything uh, yeah. in in the household, in in the home, uh, and also I worked for myself, so I was pretty busy. And also I was the Relief Society president in the stake, so That's I was supposed. So, so and five I, kids. Yeah, but the kids were kind of grown up. The the you boys for the church, right? Not or not not not, not, okay. not them okay. later. later. Yeah. Okay. okay. But, um, but that's five kids and working and he, yeah. he's working and he's gone. But the kids, the boys had been on missions and we had one son on the mission, I think. But the girls was, was in their late teens, so they lived home. But I was I was supposed to go with him when he was traveling, but I, I really couldn't because I had I had a work and then I had my own shoe shop. Uh, so, so I was owner of that, and and the Relief Society president responsibilities. Yeah. It, it didn't. It felt not so good. Yeah. So, just really quickly about mm -hmm. that, I, you know, occasionally I hear about someone say, I, "I was resentful that my dad or my husband had to work so much," but I, but I think the majority of the time, what I hear is, "I was fine. We were serving the Lord. It was it was a chosen." It was a it was a calling of God, and it was all good. You know, I, I was mm -hmm. happy to be sacrificing for the Lord. Wh mm -hmm. Which was it for you, or was it both? It was both, I think. Okay. Because seeing Hans, um, I often took him to the airport and left him there, and sometimes he went di direct from his work, and then he came home on Sundays, and he was kind of when he left, he was kind of tired of one week's work, and. And when he came home on Sundays, he was uplifted and uh, happy and uh, full of strength. And this was kind of a miracle to see that. Yeah. So, but of course, it was, it was um, not healthy. It's kind of grueling. Yeah. 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 Hans, who are some? Tell us who are some of the general authorities you worked with as an area authority that we would know their names. I think you will know uh, Elder Rasband. One of the apostles. We know uh, Elie Tobler. No, he's really he's seventy, and to his seventy, Marlin Jensen is quite famous, I think. Yeah. We talked about him in the Sweden Res Swedish yes, Rescue yes. episode. And Swick. Uh huh. Swick. Elie Swick, I think. Yep. And was Elder Holland around? Uh, nope. But he was okay. well, he was around, but not with me. Okay. But one of the most famous, like uh, uh, Jeremy talked about, uh, L. Tom Perry. Okay. I worked with him, served, I mean, with him for a year. Okay. <gasps> so he came to Europe. Yeah, he was assigned to Europe because the church said that Europe is an aging lady, kind of. The uh, the old 
the pig get older and older, and they were worried about if you go that way too long, there is, I mean, the older people die faster than the young ones. So, yeah. Yep. So th there was a concern that, that Europe was becoming an aging yep. lady. I hate, I hate that term, but. Oh, that. we say aging, aging though. Yeah. Not lady. Oh, just okay. Aging. aging. Yep. And so he so came he to help revitalize. So he was assigned for a year to find out why. Okay. What what kind of revelation can he got when he's here? Okay. All right. Besides so, his I mean, briefcase. So. We'll talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that.